Hello and welcome to the Music Is My Life podcast from Berkeley Online. I'm your host, Pat Healy. And take note that at the end of this episode, you'll have an opportunity to enroll in a Berkeley Online course for $100 off the original price. Stay tuned to the credits or look for the details in the meta description of this episode. But now, let's get to our guest, Andy Stack. You may know him as one half of Y Oak, along with Jen Wasner, but he also makes up one whole of Joyero. He released the first Joyero album on Merge Records last year, and as Y Oak assembles for their first tour in a while, and their first tour ever with more than just Jen and Andy, they'll be playing some of those Joyero tunes. In this episode, Andy takes us through his musical life, from Everclear covers in grade school, to meeting his longest term musical collaborator in high school, to attending Berklee College of Music, to getting away from it all for a while in Marfa, Texas, right up to this exciting new tour. But it all started for Andy with his parents and the music they introduced him to. So straight up now, Andy, tell us about it. My parents played some really cool stuff when I was growing up. Like, uh, well, I, I still consider it cool. Like, like I remember a lot of like Paula Abdul and um, like that kind of stuff that was going on in the, the mid eighties. And they were also into talking heads, Paul Simon, and um, of course, like the Beatles, that kind of stuff. So I, I just got a lot of music and like, it was always a really joyful thing. And like my dad still to this day is like a great dancer. And it, it's always just been a really supportive, artistic household. I actually got into drums when I was like really little in, in preschool. And I did like, I had like a little toy drum set and there's like a, a really rad picture of me wearing a kimono and playing drums when I was like five years old. <laughs> I didn't get into drums as in like follow that thread. Um, I came back to drums when I was in high school um, and then in college. But I, yeah, I studied a little bit of piano and then I joined bands when I was, I guess, in middle school when I was probably about 11 or 12, something like that. I started playing like cover songs. And uh, actually my um, very old friend who I don't talk to hardly at all anymore just sent completely unsolicited sent this link to all these digitized vhs tapes that he had found in his parents like attic i guess that were like the very first i think the first and second performances of our middle school band uh called bug house <laughs> that was like <laughs> Oh, it, it it was like if somebody wanted to blackmail me, there was definitely some incriminating <laughs> stuff. What, um, what songs were you doing? Well, we did do some original stuff, but uh, we were doing some like, I mean, I'm sure I'm going to date myself here, but it was like Everclear and Third Eye Blind. And uh, I don't remember what else we were playing, but like, yeah, we were fully drinking that like uh, mid 90s rock radio Kool-Aid at that point. So I did that for a long time and and um basically from, you know, 11 or 12 on I I was always playing in bands. Through high school I played saxophone in band and and started to kind of learn um theory doing that kind of thing. And also um I went to this high school is a public high school in 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 Baltimore or outside of Baltimore that had a steel drum band, like the Trinidadian instrument. And I did all through high school, I played in this steel drum band um, that did like, you know, carnival tunes, like uh, like these big e extravagant arrangements that they play, w which sometimes are really, really tough, really challenging. And that would be the, like to, to actually learn some of these like legit panorama tunes that, that they would do in Trinidad would be like the big project of the band for the year. So we would, we would work that up. And, and I, you know, I definitely learned a lot from that. It's not exactly something that in terms of like aesthetic or style that I would say stuck with me, but it, it definitely got me going on, on theory and, you know, just like, like the drum I played itself was, the, it was like the, the sort of soprano voice like the lead voice of the of the band and the instrument itself is laid out in a circle of fifths 
Um, it's like when you look at when you look at a graphical representation of circle of fifths, that's just the drum. And so <laughs> you have this um, really kind of valuable insight into how stuff goes together just from learning to play this instrument. And, you know, even to this day, I, I still kind of mentally reference, you know, that, that shape when I'm thinking of stuff. Um, yeah, so I, I did that. And the other thing about that, which was great, was uh, we didn't have a, a marching band or anything like that. Um, that was sort of like my version of it. But we would play like 30 or 40 concerts a year. We would do all these field trips and go around and play at like elementary schools and old folks homes and different like school district events. And it was like a, it was like a proper gigging band that um that i was in for four years of high school and it 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 sort of normalized this idea of like going to the gig and like you load in and you set up and and you just kind of get used to the you know the in and out of that so that was that was super valuable and i i still have a steel drum um have you played it on any recordings i i have a little bit i i've um (laughs) it's one of those things where like every I don't know, four or five years, there's some reason to do it. But the the latest thing, the most recent thing I did with it was my friend Roberto was in my neighborhood here in Durham. And there was, there's a studio, or at the time there was a studio basically right across the street from where I live that belonged to Sylvanesso. Oh wow! Who are friends of mine down here, and he was, and he makes uh, Roberto makes music as uh, Halado Negro. He he made this record that was ended up being like on a ton of the best of 2019 lists. It's it's this sort of like soft spoken electroacoustic record, and I we were hanging out a bunch, and uh, he had asked Jen, who was also living in the neighborhood, my my bandmate from Wyoke, if she would play a little guitar on it. So she was playing guitar and. He said something to her like, oh, yeah, you know, here's some of the other songs. And like, I have this like really weird idea that I'd love to have steel drum on this song. And she was like, well, uh, (laughs) I know just the guy for you. And so I went over and recorded for uh, an afternoon. And um, there's a few songs on the record that have, have steel drum. And man, it's just beautiful music. And and did you know right away, like as as soon, I I guess at what point did you recognize that you wanted to go to a music school i i don't i don't have any like cool story about having a revelation about it i i just it was something that i was really i was really passionate about all through school and um i think the idea of what i was gonna do in music shifted after i went to music school like i i i started going to berkeley doing jazz composition and i was a bass a bass student there and I was doing like uh, mostly electric bass, but a little bit of stand up bass too. And I really wanted to be like a jazz dude. I wanted to like get into that world and perform and, and write. And after a, a year or two of that, I, I realized that it just wasn't like where my head was and it wasn't where my passion was. But yeah, I mean, in terms of studying music, like I, I you know, it it wasn't a hard thing. Like all of the schools I applied to were for, for music. I wasn't like uh, sp- splitting my potential uh, studies. What were you listening to at that time? And, and how do you think where you went to school informed that? My memory of being at Berkeley is sort of this split screen because I was really interested in pursuing jazz as a as a composer and as a player. I was playing bass. I was playing electric and upright bass, which I still play, but like honestly, it's not <laughs> it's like kind of a secondary thing for me at this point. Right. But at that time I was playing it a lot and I was really working hard and doing all the, you know, exercises and lessons and not just not really connecting so much with it and you know listening to a lot of jazz listening like i was super into this probably like super cliched for like a berkeley student from like 2002 2003 but like you know when i got there i like got into like brad meldow and i got into um like that kind of new i don't know if you'd even call it fusion but like what he was doing these it's almost like this like olympic level uh 
performance style. Um, like he's just such a shredder and like the bad plus, which was sort of like bending what the perception of like what academic music could be, if you want to put that sticker on it. Yeah. Um, so I was really near that. And then like the split screen side of it was like, I was coming back to Baltimore where I grew up and like actually really integrating into the scene there and starting to be interested in the idea of recording. And I was discovering like Jim O'Rourke and and like Tortoise and the um those couple of records that Wilco made with Jim O'Rourke around that time. You know, a lot of that sh- kind of Chicago stuff and like Stereo Lab. I was super into Stereo Lab at that time and stuff that was like I mean, it's funny because th- a lot of those people kind of came out of like academic music as well. But like my perception of it was not as academic music. It was more as it was like experimental rock music. And mm-hmm. I it, it was um, totally changing my mind about what kind of music I wanted to make at the time. And so there was this rub for me um, for a lot of the time that I was at Berkeley, which was that I was sort of studying this one path academically, but it wasn't really the stuff that I was getting excited about. And I think it took a while to reconcile it, but all Ultimately, in in retrospect, I feel like it all worked together pretty nicely. There was a lot that I actually got from my time at Berkeley from, you know, just really cementing my my understanding of theory and then I could go and and bring it into the real world, which I think that was the biggest thing was like when I was at Berkeley, I wasn't actually bringing it into the real world the way that I I wanted to. But when I when I left, um, when I took some time off, I started playing, honestly, I started playing in bar bands and I know it's like, it's not, uh, the like weird experimental Chicago stuff that we're talking about, but like I started playing in this band in Baltimore that was doing like two or three bar gigs a week. And we were doing like, like Hank Williams songs and like George Jones songs and all these like sort of country and Americana covers and, and, and some originals too, but, but like, you know, playing four hours at a time for these bar gigs. And, um, I had never really been in that kind of setting before of kind of getting thrown in and like really having to use your ear in a way that you don't use it the same way if you're playing, uh, playing in like a garage band or something where you kind of have, you have your like 30 or 40 minute set that's very polished and you know how everything goes. And then suddenly I was playing these like George Jones songs that I had never heard before and had to just kind of use my ear and, and, and pick it up. Were you, were you doing bass or drums? I was playing bass. I was playing like upright bass a lot for that. Oh, wow. Okay. And I, at that point I wasn't really playing drums very much. Okay. Um, I had a drum set but i was a bass player you know the thing that i got was that i was able to take uh i was able to take my you know this theory foundation and like actually apply it in the real world and it definitely uh helped and saved my ass and and kind of made made it so that i could actually do the thing uh, and make a little money and and just kind of be in the mix with with some players some of these people in baltimore who were like really legit great great players for me when i was when i was like in that time i mean the thing was i was a kid like you you know i didn't feel like it at the time but i was just you're just a kid when you're in college and like you are still grasping and trying to figure out what means some you know what everything means to you i I, yeah i I definitely had that kind of split screen while i was there that i was i was doing doing my academic stuff but then i was also i was going in a kind of different direction and and that ultimately ended up with I, I left Berkeley for good, and that was sort of when Y Oak was getting started properly. And we pretty much started recording our first record, I think, right around the time that I left Berkeley for good. At the time, I was dating Jen, uh, my who is now my bandmate, who is like, you know, much more like old family, like a sibling now. Right. But we we dated for the first few years that we were a band, and. And we grew up, we went, we met in high school. So we've known each other for like a gazillion years. I was, I was living in Boston, but I was like traveling back to Baltimore. You know, I, it seems like maybe every other weekend. And we were starting to formulate the ideas of playing what, what ended up becoming Y Oak. And we were writing songs together. And, um, and I was playing in this other kind of like bar band doing, you know, 
country and Americana kind of stuff. I, I ended up finishing school at UMBC, which is like a part of the University of Maryland system. And I and when I went back, I did recording and and had you know I I, I just kind of like brushed off like I, I f- fully. Uh, removed myself from the pretense that I was going to be a jazz composer or performer. And I, I went into to recording and that was great. Honestly, that was like a, a really great move. Did any of the stuff you did at that time carry over into anything you released professionally? Yeah, the the first two Y Oak records. Oh, were, that's awesome. Were done in the recording studio at UMBC. And the second, the, the second record, which was called The Knot, was my senior project. Wow. <laughs> uh, it was great. It, I mean, we did uh, we did our first record there, and and a buddy of mine who was well, I had a couple a couple friends who helped me mix it. The recording was all done at my school, and then we self released that record. And I was in recording class, and like was sending the record out to uh, labels and blog. That's when Merge picked us up. And I was like in my recording class when I got an email from Mac from Merge and um, kind of lost my shit in the middle of my recording class. Cause it was like <laughs> the, the, the really like our dream label um, of, of who we wanted to work with. Now tell me a little bit about, I, I don't think I even knew that you and Jen were ever dating. Most of the time when I was doing music journalism full time, I'd kind of like tried to find the balance between asking that question and not asking that yeah. question. Well, it's, it's a pretty cliched question for the like guy girl duo. It is. It's the worst. Yeah. And it's certainly not something that we ever wanted to like advertise. Right, right. Um, which came first, your romantic relationship or the band? Not not like not in priority, but like which in chronology. <laughs> <laughs> um well Playing music together came first. Um, we met when we were like fifteen, and the first the first day we ever met each other, we were playing music together, and and we ended up like being in this band in like kind of late high school and early college. And were you always drumming? No, I wasn't really drumming at all. I was playing bass and guitar and um, singing a little bit, but that was also. Uh, like some of the beginnings of Jen writing songs, like she had never played in a band before. I had, I had been doing, um, Everclear covers, you know, since <laughs> you were I was in, season pro. Yeah. Since I was like 11 or 12 and, but she had, she was like 15, I think, and had never, had never played in a band, but, um, like showed up to this like high school band practice and like had made had like written keyboard parts for the songs that we had written and like was super prepared and we were like what the like what the fuck this is amazing she's incredible she's hired and um at what point did you and jen decide us two are doing music together and that's that there's nobody else involved for now and when we were about probably 20 or so um, we were, we had some songs we had been writing that we wanted to perform and also maybe more specifically, we wanted to record. I think at the time, everybody who had been playing in this one band had sort of dispersed and was in school or working or living, living in different places. You know, we were just spending all of our time together and we're also just like, kind of um consuming the same like media the same the same music and and just getting really excited about the same stuff and it was right when i was starting to do uh recording uh to study recording and and you know have like a a really simple little kind of like mbox uh system for myself the beauty of all that is like you don't really need extra people you just you just overdub it and that it 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 was a it was a recording project and you know honestly still to this day that's sort of what Wyok is um you know we we figure out how to do it live uh but like we generally get more excited about like uh working in the studio and writing in the studio and um the sort of like cr- creating like a, a sonic world right. for ourselves and so you, you do that and you're you're in school, you record if children, and then uh, you get the email from Merge and uh, 
Yeah. So w- were you the one who was working to get the demo out there or? Yeah. Ge- I generally was doing all that stuff. Like um, we didn't have any kind of manager or, you know, there, we didn't, we didn't have any kind of people helping us land a record deal. And, and we honestly at that point had no clue what, you know, that that was something that people even did. Um, I think we maybe actually had somebody who was helping book us shows at the time, but, uh, but yeah, it, it was, it was a, a very simple, um, operation of just a couple of kids and, um, yeah, like Matt, the, one of the great things about merge records is that like they, they still are independent. They still are like really scrappy and like they still will just like, pick up artists who they they just enjoy the music and like they're not um they don't they don't have to answer to anyone they just if they like the record they'll they'll give it a try and and they did that with us and you know our first couple records uh i don't you know i don't think ever did that well but we um you know it's a it's a really cool kind of familial uh, connection with that label where it's like once you're in the in the club you can kind of keep um you know working with them and they're excited to keep working with you and you know it shows because like i just put a solo record out you know 15 years later or some something like that and and they were super down to work with me on it right was there any nervousness at all like to do something like that with them as far as well will they accept this well uh I think there was some like naivete uh, about what it means to get a record deal. Right. And you know, I, I, I still think people, people experience that all the time. Um, like people think like, Oh, if you're signed to a label, then like you're set up and they'll like do everything for you. And you know, the reality is like, it didn't change our situation all that much. I think I can look back and I think at the time I thought that that was going to change our lives but we were just we were hustling and we were just playing a lot of shows and putting ourselves out there and and like being out there and touring and making connections and like trying to make good music is like so much more important than whatever the record label connection is was it just an assumed thing that merge will do our solo stuff or was was there any trepidation there yeah i didn't for the joyero project i didn't really know what the protocol was and i just you know they were the first people that i sent the record to it's a brand new untested thing so i didn't have any preconceptions that they owed me anything or anything like that and i did have to wait i I did kind of have to wait in line they were they were booked out like a year in advance at the point that I sent it into them. But at the same time, like I didn't really want to work with another label and I didn't really want to take that and shop it around and probably end up putting it out with somebody who I was going to be less excited about working with than merge. Right. But yeah. They're, I mean, they're pretty rad about doing side projects and um, you know, the, the other band that I play in pretty consistently right now is, is lamb chop. They've been on merge for like, 27 years or something like that and keep putting music out and keep getting more weird and doing weirder side projects and like merge keeps putting stuff out it is kind of familial in that way speaking of the joy era stuff was were these songs something that you've been working on for years and years and just stored them up over time and finally had to get them out or was it just like hey i'm gonna tried recording some stuff and compose in the studio or it it wasn't a super long stretch of time but i it was like a couple of years that that the songs had been piling up and Mm -hmm. um it was all while i was living in marfa the record got finished right around the time that i moved from there to to north carolina It, it was i i definitely wanted to finish that collection of songs they really feel to me like they're of a time and a place um like they they're they're definitely like a a little bit of a portrait of like a a period of my life and so i i did want to release them as as kind of a collection but it seems like i mean just looking at the songs and their structures and the words and it seems like something that this was not your first foray into songwriting uh it was not my first uh 
the first songs I've ever written. Like on the first Y.O. Cracker and, and on the second, there are some songs that I sing that I was sort of like the primary writer of. I, I kind of stepped back from writing for, for Y.O. for a number of reasons. Like, you know, mainly those being that Jen is a, like objectively better singer than I am. <laughs> and and that when we would play live, I was playing drums and I was doing this kind of like juggling act of playing drums and keyboards. And like every time I would try to sing in in the live setting for Y Oak, it just felt so overdone. Like I, I I was I was not really able to keep up with all these things that I was juggling. I just it 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 fell away. I sort of stopped like writing words and I started focusing more on writing, you know, music stuff and that became more my contribution and then we kind of fell into more specific roles in terms of like, you know, Jen would write the words and, and would sing. And I had been writing, but honestly, when I, when I started writing this collection of songs for Joy Arrow, it was, I, I really had to rediscover my voice and it felt like the first time. Um, it felt like I was singing for the first time and, um, you know, definitely touring on this record which i've done a, a good bit of this year is like a whole other level of discovering my voice and yeah what, what are you doing in addition to singing i have a an ableton setup for joy Arrow. and um so there's some tracks going and you know i i always as is the case with y oak when i use ableton and y oak you know when i've done it in other bands like i i try to create a, as like organic of a structure as i can within within ableton so that there's like a good bit of kind of uh randomness and flexibility and but i've got that and then i've got a like a guitar and saxophone signal path that that's you know guitar and saxophone running through electronics um and uh, and then i sing and it's just you up there it's just me yeah yeah there's a tour coming up in um february and march of of 2020 that's gonna be oh it's a y oak tour but we're we're doing uh we're gonna do some joy arrow songs and we're also gonna do some flock of dimes songs which is Jen's uh, solo project, which she's she's done one right. record. Oh, that's uh, really cool. Few, yeah, so we're we're basically we we don't because of these other things that we're doing, and Jen's been touring in Bonavere and has kind of been pulled into that world. Um, and so her she's like right in the middle of a touring cycle right now, and so we we just don't have as much time to um, to put to Y Oak at this moment that we feel like um, we want to do anything other than, um, you know, play the songs that we're excited to play. And so in that, in, in this case, it's like, we're going to do some Y Oak stuff. We're going to do some of the things from our solo project and we're going to do some new stuff. Um, but we're going to have uh, like a five piece band for that. Uh, which we've never done. It's a, it's a much bigger operation than we've ever done for a Y Oak tour. The band for the Y Oak tour is going to be uh, Pinson from uh, the Space Bomb crew down in Richmond. Yeah. Uh, who works with Matthew E. White. And uh, he's playing drums, actually, which is another weird uh, twist on, on the Y Oak tour because I, uh, in the like five billion tours that Y Oak has done over the years, I've always been just the drummer. And well, right. I've played other stuff too, but. Uh, um, but yeah, we've never had a different drummer. So uh, he's doing that. We're having Aaron Dyer, who um, lives in Hudson, and she was in New York for a long time and uh, was in this band called Buke and Gase that oh, yeah. made this really great kind of progressive, melodic, post-genre <laughs> kind of yeah, music. It was, it was weird stuff. <laughs> I liked that. Yeah, stuff. they were great. And she and I have collaborated on um, another project called Spiritual America. She is a delight. And um, so she's going to play. And uh, the, the last person to, that we're adding is Adam Schatz, who has a project called Landlady. And... Um, Recently was touring with Jen um, in this Sylvan Esso expanded band. Um, and he plays saxophone uh, much better than I play saxophone. 
Okay. So, so uh, what it's are like, you it's like, we just, we just like got a band full of people who'd play the same stuff that I play, but better than I can play. Right, right. So what are you doing then? <laughs> um, I'm going to, I probably will play some saxophone, but I will I'll mostly play bass and guitar and, and some like electronic stuff. I think Jen and I are pretty much both going to do that. We're going to like play bass and guitar and sing and do electronics. And oh, that's um, great we're just going to have this like expanded palette that we, that we have never, you know, in the studio, you know, all bets are off, but when we play live, it's always been something where we're like, um, fighting against, uh, the limitations of, you know, the, right. the human body. <laughs> I mean, I'm uh, interested to know like what your opinion will be like when you're playing these songs, it'll probably be hard not to focus on the differences that the players are playing to parts that you created. Yeah, I think that is true, but honestly, I'm really excited about it. And, um, you know, well, especially on drums, like Pinson is just the best. He's, he's just got such amazing feel and he's so thoughtful and like inventive in his approach I'm just looking forward to like being in the, in the middle of a Y Oak show and like being able to kind of like let my guard down and like be in the moment a little bit rather than being like, Oh, I have like 8 million things that I have to be doing at once. So is that going to be your approach with playing with these other people? Just like, Hey, here are the songs as they are recorded, figure them out, but then do whatever the hell you want. Yeah. I mean, we, we have, <laughs> we have like a, like a Google spreadsheet with like, you know, arrangement ideas for like what everyone should be covering in the song. But Jen and I are both pretty psyched at the idea of like creating a template and then letting it shift. Yeah. Um, and we, you know, we picked the people that we picked because we have full confidence in their technical and creative abilities Tell me just a little bit about, um, because we, we did discuss the relationship and I, I do, I'm curious about the time frame. So you guys, you started playing music together. Then when was the relationship? When did it begin and when did it end? Uh, we dated, Chen and I dated in the, it's probably like 05 to oh nine or something like that oh six to oh nine you functioned more as for for a longer period of time as platonic band members than uh romantic band oh members. yeah much yeah. much longer um, Interesting. it's it's definitely a past life kind of thing for us yeah and we you know we also had a a friendship which is maybe why we were able to kind of like weather a relationship and a, and a breakup Right. Um, but right. we did, you know, we, we did um, have this like mutual split when we, when we broke up and we also were like really excited about our musical um, collaboration at the time and, you know, sent out this note to everyone we worked with um, at Merge and, and our like booking agent and this and that saying like yeah this is happening but like we're still doing the band and i think everyone kind of like rolled their eyes a little bit like sure you are um and it took it definitely took a long time I, I feel like for years after our relationship ended we were constantly running into people being like oh i, w- I didn't think like you guys were a band anymore like literally for like for like seven or eight years uh wow. after our relationship are there any songs about Y Oak in the Joy Arrow project? I always wonder that because, you know, when like <laughs> somebody like goes solo, they like write about their band a How little bit. How you've been wronged by your yeah. uh, <laughs> collaborators. It's, it's just, it just sounds like it's such a living, breathing band that it's probably not the case with. Um, no. Yeah. Is the, is the simple. <laughs> one syllable but answer but no it's not <laughs> yeah no it's definitely a very personal record but and and you know jen and i are very close and um you know she's got my back and and vice versa um like we've we've been through a lot together but um you know i, I would not say jen is my muse 
<laughs> right, right. Um, having lived in so many different areas and now, when did you settle into Durham? Uh, almost two years now. In yeah, okay. So having lived in so many different places, how do you feel where you are informs the music that you make? Well, I think the, to start with, we we started, Jen and I started Y Oak in Baltimore. And at the time that we were getting into it, which is also when I was like leaving school and, and moving back to Baltimore, it was like the coolest it was just the it was like the 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 greatest scene um and i'm sure a lot of people say that about their scene but it was just like such a a a special time for the baltimore uh scene for the community um and it was like uh beach house was just getting started and future islands was there and dan deacon was um like right kind of coming into his prime which seems to have not ended he's just continually putting great stuff out and he was also just this kind of like linchpin of the community and 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 really like leading people into some some exciting places creatively um this band lower dens who are still around Jana hunter um they were like putting their first record out maybe just a little bit after why oak started and there's just so there was so much great stuff going on so it was something in the air like that was that was really important and um it was a cheap place to live so people were able to you know unlike living in like you know new york where everyone has to have like three jobs just to get by or even by boston i would assume um people could live for very little there and um i don't i don't think that's exactly the case anymore and i think baltimore is pretty uh, different different in terms of the scene now but yeah like 10 to 15 years ago it was it was really influential uh on me marfa when i lived there it's about isolation honestly and um not always for the better but i think there's something about you know like i was saying it's it's sort of like a like a permanent residency kind of situation and and all of the self-doubt and and difficulty that comes along with being in a residency you feel there um it's it's very isolated and you're kind of alone with your thoughts and and for me i you know a record came out of it it was great and i and like you know i found my voice i think honestly and i i don't know i you know i for for most of my career i had always kind of been a collaborative player um and and hadn't really stepped up front and i think living in marfa living in such isolation i I had no choice like if i wanted to make a record i really needed to just do it myself and not not um wait for anyone else to give me permission so that was good and um you know honestly durham right now i feel is maybe it's just perfect. I, I don't. I don't want to say it's my favorite, but it's like it, it's about community here. It's it's there, there's like this really strong dedication to craft uh, amongst the the musicians here that I don't feel like I've experienced in any of the other places that I've lived. Um, people people really work hard and make music a job instead of like just being like a cool accessory that they carry around um people really people really hustle and there's a lot of a lot of people who are working musicians touring musicians in pretty successful projects here in this small city um it's just it's it's a really strong community in a in a um maybe kind of an unexpected place do you think that you needed the isolation of Texas to appreciate what you've got now in Durham? I mean, it definitely feels like a breath of fresh air after feeling like um, a little bit trapped, a little bit isolated. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I mean, I don't know. I've never, I've never lived in a place that is exactly like this um like durham like i like i I was saying baltimore is um baltimore was really strong as a scene but the scene the the scene was pretty different than durham 
Um, and it was much more like the, the, there's this influence from Micah from the art school that's in Baltimore. Um, and you know, it was like the, the aesthetic, um, was sort of like very forward in the Baltimore scene when I was coming up there. And that's less of a thing here. Like everybody plays with everyone here and, and there's no, there's really no like, um, elitism or pre pretension about like the kind of music that people are into. Like for instance, um, my buddy, Joe, Joe Westerlin, who's an amazing drummer. He was in megaphone and, um, collaborates. Now he plays, with a bunch of people, but like, for instance, he plays with like, um, you know, mandolin orange, which is this, this string band. And it's, it's just really hushed, simple music. And then like the next night he'll be doing like Ornette Coleman songs. And then the next night he'll be doing like, um, you know, ex experimental percussion sets. And, um, he's just all over the place. And there's a lot of people here like that. Um, really unpretentious, which do you prefer? Oh, well, obviously not not pretentious versus unpretentious. <laughs> but, um, but as far as uh, your 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 range over the past like two years is has gone from like playing on your own, playing in Y Oak with just you and Jen, to playing in Y Oak with a huge group of people coming up. Yeah, it's uh, what what suits your your style the best? Playing with a lot of other people, playing with a few um, people. I don't know. Why do you have to pick the happy place for me is all of the above. And it's, um, and, and fortunately I think the reality of being a working musician is that you have to do all of the above. Um, you know, unless you're extremely fortunate, um, or you, you know, you strike it big or you get, you know, some kind of ridiculous, uh, song that just gets sync licensed forever like you just have to work and do everything and for me that means playing in multiple groups writing music within groups writing solo music writing music for commercials doing sound design for commercials you know just hustling and honestly like the times when i'm hustling and when i'm like doing a whole bunch of different projects at the same time that's when I feel the best. Um, and when I'm doing, you know, during the years where Y Oak plays like 150 shows or something like that, it, it's, it's kind of, kind of crushing. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a blessing to tour. I, I love touring and I, I love, um, being a part of that project, but like the, the like grind of like a full, full throttle record cycle is, um, I don't think it makes you a better musician, really. Um, at least not the the kind of music that we make. I I think like having variety and playing with different people. Um, that's that's the stuff that I love. That really is what's great about playing music, isn't it? Having variety and playing with different people. Andy Stack and Jen Wasner are currently touring with a variety of Y Oak songs with a whole lot of different people. The tour starts on February 27th in Asheville, North Carolina. And to see if they're playing near you, check out yoakmusic.com. So at the top of the show, I told you that there's a way that you can receive a $100 discount on a Berkeley Online course. So here's how to redeem this special offer. Head over to musicismylifepod.com right now. In addition to the discount, you'll get all sorts of links to free resources. Anyway, this episode was edited by Talia Smith, mastered by Gabriel Reifer Cohen. All visual assets coordinated by Mike DeBenedictus. Social media by Brooke Larson. Web assistance courtesy of Mark Thomas, Steve Zimmerman, Joe McDonough, and Chris Keen. I wrote and recorded the Music Is My Life theme song. But the expert remixing comes courtesy of Lily Dickinson. Special thanks to Mike Gallo and Gretchen Klein. And thanks to you for listening. Take note to join us on Monday, March 2nd for Spider Stacy of the legendary Pogues. He's currently touring with original Pogues bassist Kat O'Riordan and the New Orleans band Lost Bayou Ramblers. Together, they perform under the moniker of Pogatry. 
The tour kicks off February 28th in New Orleans. And I'll tell you about the rest of the tour in two weeks. Spider Stacy will tell you all about his musical life. We'll talk then. <laughs>